how well do you remember vanilla World of Warcraft? Why not stick around and find out? Hello, this is Matt, and like many WoW fans, lapsed or not, I'm quite excited right now. Battle for Azeroth, the latest expansion for World of Warcraft, is almost here, and Blizzard has confirmed the relaunch of the classic version of WoW, we just don't have a release date yet. Now, some of us stopped playing WoW and never came back, and some of us have been here the entire time, watching the landscape change like seasons in the real world. But if we look back at Warcraft's humble beginnings, how different is it really? Well, very different, it turns out. We've got extra races, streamlined quests, and even new continents. But as we'll hopefully see under all the cosmetic stuff, the very marrow of WoW has transmogrified, so much that the vanilla version of the game would feel alien to anyone playing the modern. So if you recall the vanilla day, stick around and see how many fond memories are sparked by this list. And if not, why not watch this list anyway and learn all the crazy things WoW veterans used to have to put up with. Here are nine things you'll only remember if you played vanilla WoW. Let's start with an obvious one. Wherever you were, or however long you played, most of your time in vanilla World of Warcraft will have been spent running. Many of the areas were huge, especially the Barrens, which we'll talk about in a bit, and prior to patch 4.2.0, flight paths all had to be discovered before a player could use them. And worst of all, you didn't get your mount until level 40. Now, at the risk of sounding like an old man shouting at a cloud, back then it'd take weeks, even months, to get there. But there was another problem as well. Learning to ride cost a fortune. Trainers would teach apprentice riding at level 40 for 100 gold, at the time a fair chunk of money. And then when you finally hit level 60, you had to pay again for the journeyman riding skill that would enable you to buy a swift mount, doubling your speed. In this case, a whopping 1,000 gold. That might sound like pocket change now, but back then, saving that much money took ages. But it was worth it. The first thing I did when I got my mount was remind myself where the walk key was just so I could saunter into the crossroads like John Wayne with tusks. Now don't get me wrong, mounts weren't rare by any means, but getting to that point was enough of a drag that you'd always, always want to show it off. This one, right, goes 60% faster. Surprisingly roomy too. And it meant that finally, finally, you could stop walking everywhere. I alluded to this in the previous entry, but making money in vanilla was a nightmare. That's not to say you never saw players with loads of gold and all the best gear, but that for many of us, making money was a grind. Everything was expensive. You could spend all your money training your skills, or hoard your money, if you'll excuse the pun, to buy that mythical mount. But few of us could afford both, and whichever way you spin it, it involved endless trips back to traders to sell all your grey junk and a lot of time and effort. Now, if you played vanilla, you probably had your own genius scheme for making stacks of cash. For me, as an aspiring herbalist, I used to farm swift thistle to sell in the auction house, a herb used by rogues to make thistle tea, popular with high-level players who didn't have time to pick their own. But swift thistle doesn't have its own node, so this meant hours and hours of picking briarthorn and mage royal to find a randomly dropping herb. I also tried fishing for deviate fish in lush water oasis, or killing mobs in the barrens in the vague hope that one would drop the recipe for savoury deviate delight, a dish that would often sell for loads in the auction house. Essentially, we were all like cereal shop pop-up hipsters, hoping our next crazy scheme would be the thing that led us to riches. So whether you were killing turtles in Hillsbrad in the hope they'd drop pearls, or murdering gorillas to game the heavy leather market on the auction house, we all had a scheme, and almost none of them worked. But at least, we were all poor together. If you've only played more recent incarnations of WoW, you probably think you've done some grinding. But the word grind has limited meaning unless you've spent three weeks, and I do mean three literal weeks, killing plane striders and zebra chargers in the barrens. Part of the problem here wasn't just the lack of quests, but the lack of alternate ways to gain XP. You didn't get XP from PvP, you didn't get it from professions, and there was no dungeon finder back then, so running an instance wasn't always worth the time and effort it took to find a group. So by far the most efficient way of gaining experience was by killing mobs. Lots and lots and lots of mobs. Everyone has an enduring memory of the place they got stuck grinding, or more likely, the multiple places. The Hinterlands, Ungoro Crater and Stranglethorn stand out the most to me, but there was another area, which we'll talk about next, that was synonymous with the vanilla WoW experience. 
Almost every Horde player who experienced Vanilla WoW will remember the Barons, and more specifically, Barons Chat, an intoxicating open latrine of Chuck Norris jokes, banter, and lost noobs asking for directions. New troll here. Now I realise by including this I'm excluding a huge portion of people who never rolled a Horde character. I personally tried both, often ineffectually, because I don't want to live my life in a world where I can't be a dwarf and a troll pirate. Anyway, there are loads of reasons why the Baron's chat was so active, and they've been covered in depth in some incredible other videos on YouTube, but I'll try to summarise them here. A lot of it came down to strange design. The Baron's was massive, the flight paths were spread out, and due to its layout, it was constantly under attack by Alliance players who just hopped off the boat at Ratchet, ran to the crossroads, and killed all the quest givers. This meant a lot of walking and a lot of chat, some people rallying to defend the crossroads, some people just hopelessly lost, trying to work out quest locations from supremely vague instructions. And the most famous of these, of course, was the quest to find Mancrick's missing wife. Barely a day would pass without someone looking for Mancrick's wife, or Mankirk if you prefer, and we all spent so long in the Barrens that it's impossible to forget. You could spend levels 10 to 25 grinding here given the size of the area and the variation in the mobs. It's different now, obviously, streamlined, bisected and a shadow of what it once was, but it's hard not to look back fondly at this bizarre, slightly broken rite of passage for Horde players. For the Horde! Our next entry is more conceptual than the others, but it can be easily summed up as knowing nothing. Because back in Vanilla WoW, the default state was basically this. The in-game tutorials were practically non-existent, so much of your time was spent tabbing between the game and sites like WoWhead, WoWWiki, and the dearly departed Thoughtbot. You also had to actually read the quest logs, even if they weren't as descriptive as they often needed to be. See Mancrick's wife in the last entry. Players would even resort to adding third-party add-ons like Quest Helper just so they knew what they were actually supposed to be doing. Your first 10 levels in WoW were usually a stumbling cocktail of getting lost, not knowing what anything did, and not knowing what anything was. These days, perhaps correctly, not knowing how to play the game is frowned upon, but back in vanilla, it really was the default state. This entry directly relates to our previous one, but in this case, we're talking specifically about your character learning stuff, because some of the decisions in vanilla WoW were utterly, brilliantly bizarre. Hunters had an epic quest solely designed around playing without their pet. The trainer, who could teach you expert enchanting, was located inside a dungeon. And if you wanted to learn engineering as a tauren, you had to find this guy. Now there are endless examples of this, but the skills themselves are most representative, with pet skills providing the ultimate example of confusing design. Your pet's offensive abilities all had ranks, which you had to learn using a different pet before you could apply them to your main. And the game never told you, so loads of hunters spent the entire game running around with the basic skills their pet came with, and you had to feed pets to keep them happy. And finally, for this section, we've got weapon skill. Whenever you found a sweet new type of weapon in vanilla, your first hour of using it was spent swinging, missing, and causing glancing blows as you leveled up your skill in it. Now, this isn't limited to vanilla WoW, as it was only removed in Cataclysm, but it's still one of those lost, interesting time wasters that brought WoW to life. Next up, we've got the old school honor system. This was removed in patch 201 when Burning Crusade arrived, but it was one of my favorite things about Vanilla WoW. By adding unlockable titles and gear, world PvP felt worthwhile. You could even lose honor by killing civilians from the opposite faction. I spent ages prowling Ashenvale looking for enemy players to kill before my friend Nathan and I moved to Duskwood and spent a month pretending to be highwaymen. I'd wait on the path as a stealthed rogue, he'd lurk in the forest as a spirit wolf, and we'd spend entire evenings ambushing Alliance players. It was pointless, annoying, and absolutely the best time I ever had playing WoW. During that time, we felt like part of the scenery in Duskwood, like a bogeyman tale Alliance mothers would tell their children to make them behave. Except, you know, we were rubbish. After that, we discovered the battlegrounds added in patch 1.5, and when 1.7 arrived, we moved to a Rathi Basin and spent weeks grinding to unlock ranks. And it's to my eternal shame and annoyance that I only got to Sergeant, while my friend got to Senior Sergeant. Not least, because I'll never, ever be able to change it. Next, we've got a bit of a catch-all entry for all those little details that used to be in the game that made it feel more like a classic, immersive RPG. 
I'm talking about things like needing wood, flint and tinder to make a campfire, and how real it felt to sit around it cooking food and talking. And things like actually needing a fishing pole to fish. That's not to say that the removal of these things is necessarily a problem. The game is a lot simpler now, hunters don't need to carry ammunition, rogues don't have bags overflowing with poison, and warlocks don't need to worry about soul shards and umpteen different types of magic stone. There were even reagents for certain spells, so if you jumped off Thunder Bluff without a feather expecting to levitate, well, it would end like this. And yes, it was a complete pain to keep those things stocked up, and it led to a lot of busy work. But there was a richness to Vanilla WoW that came from this absurd attention to detail. Our bags might be emptier these days, but it's a thinner role-playing experience because of it. And there's one more thing that you may have forgotten, the actual World of Warcraft box itself. Now this was a thing of beauty, right down from the embossed text on the top to the satisfying scritch of opening the front, because yes, this is from a time when games came with their own Velcro. I've got vivid memories of excitedly installing the game from multiple discs, one of which inevitably is now missing, not that you'd ever need it, and leafing through that chunky manual during the agonising wait for it to install. I knew nothing about the game at the time, and truthfully, it took me months to get even a limited grasp of it. Just look at it, how could you not want to play that? Why, I will enter the world of Warcraft. Thank you for asking. Now I realise that this is like 50 different things rather than 9, and that's even without all the other stuff I could mention. Paladins and shamans being faction specific, unlinked fight paths, melee hunters, Azara being completely empty, and so on. And it's not necessarily that WoW was better back then, more that there's a wonky charm to the vanilla game, like a happy dog with a wheel replacing its lost leg. So maybe it's not that we missed this stuff, the game was almost certainly worse than it is now, but more that it reminds us of that first rush of excitement, the discovery and the magic, that newbie, wide-eyed wonder at a world that seemed completely unfamiliar. And even when the vanilla re-release does arrive, it'll never be quite the same again. And that's it, thank you very much for watching. Please share your most treasured WoW memories in the comments below, give us a like if this brought back any memories, and subscribe to Logitech G for more weekly shows, features and gameplay.